Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day that you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. What does it mean to be humble? It basically means that, well, that leads to humble ability because when you're humble, it doesn't mean that you have to necessarily. When you're humble, it helps to be like, I've heard of it before, but I'm not exactly sure what it means because I learned what it was in Sunday school one time a long time ago. But I don't remember what it means now. Good to see you this morning. No? Let's stand together for a moment, please. Um, There is a... First of all, we're going to have uh, someone baptized at the end of the service. We haven't had a baptism in a while because of the COVID stuff, but we can now. And thank the Lord for that. We have others waiting. We had a great number in our new member orientation today. Just a lot of good things. But you saw in the presentation by our choir and our music and worship, it was great, how they, how Scripture was quoted while they were, before they were singing in intermittent places, which was a good thing to do. The only bad news about that is they told me that uh, they were hoping that I would follow suit and sing one of my page notes on this sermon. Don't look worried. I'm not. Relax. If we ever get too many people here, that's how we get rid of them. I sing, and they're gone. They've had enough. Well, it's great to see you smile a little bit. My goodness. We want to be alive, awake, and excited about worshiping the Lord. You know the most exciting time you should have in your life is when you come to the house of the Lord and thank Him and praise Him and worship Him. That's the best part of the week, don't you think? Amen. Now that's sounding more like liberty. That's great. Let's have prayer. Our Father, we thank You this morning for the opportunity to have Your Word, how You have written it, inspired it. It's infallible. It's the Word of God. You don't ever change. We don't have to worry about changing. We realize that we need to improve. And all the things you have taught us and doctrines we have in the Word of God, everything we need to know is in the Word of God. Therefore, help us to know what your Word promises and says and study very, very, very hard, very de- de- just a priority thing. Help it to be a priority, not just read a verse here and there. Many Christians are starving themselves during the week. They're not studying the Word. And you said that's how you approve us. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So breaking down the words and the Jews, the Gentiles, the nation of Israel and the church and the world at large, we need to know the scriptures about those things. Then we can reckon what we can do with our life and we can yield to your leadership. Help us this morning, dear Holy Spirit, to be able to retain something that will help us Maybe two or three things that will help us to be better servants and better Christians and help us to realize our journey and pilgrim's progress on this earth is to carry the gospel to all the world. Thank you for all those that are helping and doing that. And thank you again for your grace toward us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Yesterday, we had a great tournament, as we said, but there's more than that. 36 years ago, Uh, I met with some other pastors, and we were determined to start pregnancy centers to help us get babies adopted and not aborted. And God has given us success at the rate of hundreds and hundreds of babies that are now living in good homes that we place them into by our attorneys. Isn't that good news? I mean, you know, why why preach about something if you're not going to do anything about it? A lot of people preach, oh man, I wish I could have helped these poor people in third world countries in India and all those places. You know, praying is wonderful, but you can't just pray. Faith without works is what? Let's hear it again. I don't think everybody got it. Faith without works is what? Saying we love without giving is not godly because the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave. 
So it means nothing if we have good thoughts if we don't do something about it. Would you agree? Amen. amen. Now, it's okay. You're in a Bible church. If you, do, if you ever say amen, nobody's going to come get you and throw you out. You're welcome. Amen. All right. Well, you know, it's, uh, life is tough sometimes. I mean, what you say has a lot to do with how people react. For instance, I had a friend who went into a convenience store, and there was a lady there, and she was all frazzled, couldn't get the, couldn't get the receipts to work, couldn't get part of the computer to work, was having to figure out what people were buying. She was just, I mean, beside herself. And he realized that, and he was trying to be nice, and he picked up three items, and it, she figured it up. It was $22 on the dot. He said, well, now that's a nice round figure. And she said, you're no beanpole yourself. <laughs> you have to really be specific about what you say, right? Okay. Stand with me, if you will, and I want to ask you to turn in your Bibles if you have them. If you do not, Robert is so kind and good that he will put the Scriptures on the screens for us. First Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 10. First Peter Chapter 5, verses 5 to 10. Now, the scriptures tell us here, uh, in this passage, something that is very dynamic in our Christian life. First of all, you should have a desire to be a better Christian, if you're a Christian. Would you say that's true? Yes. Without desire, it isn't going to happen. God says that we have not because we ask not. Or we ask amiss. Asking amiss means praying about stuff that has no relevance or really nothing to do with the real priorities of life. So if you'll look at this passage, we'll read it together. And here the Bible says and addresses younger Christians in this particular area where Peter had gone to preach the gospel, establish churches, and so forth. And he said, likewise, you younger, and he's meaning younger in age as well as younger in the faith, Submit yourselves unto the elder. <clears throat> now, what is he saying here? He isn't saying wash their car. <clears throat> First of all, they didn't have cars back then. He wasn't even saying wash their chariot. He wasn't even saying go clean their house, although if they were ill, that would be a good thing to do, wouldn't it? Amen. He's saying serve the elder who can teach you, train you, and help you to know what they have learned. So all of you ladies that I'm not calling you old, no way. All of you men that are mature, all of you ladies that are mature, you've been saved a while. You could have been saved very young and now just middle-aged or less. But you've learned a lot. You've been in a Bible church. The Bible says you have an obligation and a responsibility to do your best, not only to be a great example, but to teach younger girls younger people about the Word of God. That's why we thank the Lord for so many great Bible teachers in our church. And the classes that go on at 8.45, 9 o'clock, uh, and the ladies' classes, other classes, they're there to help you, as the Bible says we should do. Yea, all of, the, uh, all of you be subject one to another. Subject one to another means I help you, and I, I'm subject to you as a servant. What was the greatest thing Jesus talked about in our growth as Christians. He said, as he gave the example to the disciples, as he washed their feet, which was a servant's position, he said that we should be submissive, we should serve, we should help, and that's what husbands and wives do, and that's what everyone should do. So therefore, we need to be submissive. And he said, and be clothed with humility. Now, here's one we miss a lot. In fact, it was part of the greatest passage in his great teaching of the Sermon on the Mount about humility. Humility is hard to come by in America because everything is built in capitalism and politics on building up how great you are. And it flows over into the church. And if we can't do something great, oh no, I don't want to do that. But if you find something great I could do, I'll be glad to do it if I'm in the spotlight. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about other churches I've known. <laughs> and as a Christian, we sometimes think like that because we've been taught in the culture to think like that. Now, could I give you some good counseling right now from a man who's been around a long time? When you turn in to Liberty out here on any of these streets, leave 
the culture of the world there. Don't bring it here. Don't bring it here. We are not part of the culture of the world. Neither are we interested in bringing new cultures into the church. We are a Bible church, and we want you to learn the Word of God that will help you to be powerful, dynamic, and victorious in whatever relationships you have. Jesus gives us an edge and says, if you want to practice being a great Christian and have influence over others and leading others to Christ and leading others as believers, here is one of your priorities, and it's probably one one of the best. It's called humility. You heard the kids explain it, right? <laughs> How many of you have a, an idea, maybe even a foggy idea of what humility is? I think all of you do, but we just have it as an idea. We don't apply it and live by it, right? So we're praying we will. For God resists the proud. Every time we start talking about us, and get our pride coming higher, we're moving away from the will of God to our will, possibly even the will of evil forces, principalities, Satan, and so forth. Why? Because God resists the proud. God can't do any... Let me say it this way. God can't do anything for you if you're proud about it. If you want to handle your own problems, guess what? The Lord isn't going to roll you over and make you take his will. He will let you handle it until you get to, be under, to understand as a prodigal, you are in a pig pen mess. And when you can humble yourself like he did, the prodigal son, that's not what I'm preaching on, but an illustration, the prodigal son who had left a beautiful home, a father who had money, a fa- he had everything he could want, but he wanted to, under- he just, I want to, you know, I, I just want to find myself. Well, he found himself, all right, feeding the hogs as a Jewish boy was not really in the employment offices of Israel. Did you know that? So he found himself in humility. He said, even my, the servants at my father's house are doing better than me. Man, that's, that's getting pretty low. Well, you know, God will let you find humility if you're not pursuing it yourself, but the only person who can give you humility is you. You can't blame it on others. Our Father, I pray on this one point. Today, we will follow the example of so many examples given to us in the Word of God of the power of humility, I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, what what does the Lord say otherwise? Now, let's finish this verse. And He gives grace to the humble. Boy, that's that's a powerful statement. First of all, God resists you, even as his child, because God isn't going to spoil you. The Lord isn't going to say yes to everything you ask for. The Lord isn't going to say yes to, to your will and my will. The Lord isn't going to do everything we want done unless it leads to greater power and grace, which is God's gift to us of power in this life to be victorious and and an overcomer of sin in our life. If you have problems in your life, the first thing you need to do is to be humble about it. You know what that means? Confess it to God because He already knows it. Make it a matter of prayer. Make, you know, you have to fight it. I've had to fight it. Every, every Christian has to fight this all your life because we're independent. We're taught in America, you know, self-help sections in our books. Here's how you, here's how you do this. Go attend this conference and you'll be great. Attend this conference. You, hey, listen, that's not of God. Sometimes there are conferences that will help you in understanding, but it isn't going to get you to this place of humility that the Lord wants us. One guy goes into a bookstore and he says, where's your self-help section? He said, well, I would tell you, but that would defeat the purpose, wouldn't it? (laughs) Now let's look at several things. In this passage, verses 5 to 10, Likewise, you younger, be subject unto the elder. All of you be subject one to another. One thing kids and young people do not have because they have not been taught much by their parents or teachers, and I'm not saying everyone, I'm just saying it's a common thing. They don't have respect. They don't have humility. 
for older people who are the wisest among them if they had sense enough to realize that. The Bible has the answer, but you won't find it in society. You won't find it in the culture of America. If you're, if you're seeking help how to be a better person by subscribing to things in the culture out there, you are headed for a dead end. The bridge is out on the road you're on. The Bible alone can teach us the power of God, and it is done by grace. Let me move through this. So the Bible says, we grace to the humble, and Jesus said this himself, Matthew 3, 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit. He is not saying blessed are those who are poor off financially. <laughs> he isn't saying blessed are the broke. He isn't saying blessed are those who are debt ridden. That's not what he's saying. This has nothing to do primarily with that. This has to do with life, which is a lot more than possessions. If you think life is possessions and he who has the most toys wins, you haven't discovered Christian life at all. Shall I ask you who the greatest teacher was that ever lived? Shall I ask you of who the greatest example was that ever lived and what his attitude about possessions and the culture he lived in was? Have you studied that? We're Christians who've bought into the American dream, and the American dream is not the Word of God in a lot of ways. Wow, I'm not getting too many amens. But I'm used to that. I get a few amens when I'm doing certain stuff, but then it levels off, and then it goes away altogether, and all you hear is crickets. So in Matthew 3, Jesus said, we, 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 there we have the unique baptism. And listen, if you've been saved and never baptized, you're not following Jesus. He followed and was baptized of John the Baptist in the river by immersion. There was no sin in his life. He was not doing it to join anything. He did it because God says you should testify of me. And you know what baptism is? Humbleness. Some ladies have told me in the past, well, now, will it mess up my hair? I said, not if you put a shower cap on. Because we're going to put every one of your hairs under the water. You may have to do your hair after you get baptism. Aren't you humble enough to do that? The Savior did that, aren't you? That's what Jesus showed us in Matthew 3. Then in Matthew 4, we have his unique confrontation with Satan. Now, could I give you an assignment? Could I tell you this, give you an assignment? Listen. If you would begin studying Matthew 3, I mean studying it, word studies, do the things you should do. And in Matthew 4, you'll learn how to deal with the devil. It isn't arguing, it's scripture. Every time Jesus spoke, he spoke scripture. He didn't argue with the devil, scripture. If you follow politics, you'll be arguing. If you follow the culture of this world, all you're going to do is argue. A lot of you, atone, got, you've gotten refined in your, in your arguing. You're arguing, you're arguing. And you get nowhere. A person convinced against their will is unconvinced still. It is futile to argue with anybody. Give them the word. And then God can work. If you're arguing, all you've got is your words, and they aren't going to be totally right. You know that. Is that right or not? Amen? All right, listen to what else Jesus did. Then he comes to Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We call this, of course, and, and this is a... Uh, the Beatitudes. This is a great teaching time. This is the master teaching of all time. And here's what he did. Here's what he said. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. What he was saying is the spirit there are those that are humble. They know that they are sinners in need of a savior. Most people are lost in religious institution because they will not condescend to be humble enough to say, I can't save myself. Oh, I, I, I beg your pardon. If I go to certain services and if I do certain things and if I give a certain amount of money and I help out a certain amount of people, God isn't going to judge me. That's directly opposed to the word. Nobody's going to be saved without grace. And grace requires Humility. You know what it requires? 
Let me give you an illustration. I give this one once in a while because it, it's so wonderful. Jesus gave it. And he talks about the Pharisee. The Pharisee is the average religious person. They go to church. They tame a Bible preacher if they ever got one. Amen. Amen. You know it's the truth. It's controlled by a handful of people. And we're here to socially try to be respectable. We're here to socially try to be a, get a name for ourselves. The phones keep ringing and nobody's answering. Listen, religion is one of the greatest enemies of the Word of God. When you study a while, you'll know that. Well, I thought we were a religion. No, that's how the government categorizes us. We're not a religion. We're, per we're persons who teach a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hello? We don't teach join a religion. And another thing that leads to is universal religion. Well, it doesn't matter what religion you're part of. We're all the same. We're not the same. We're children of God by faith in Jesus Christ according to the infallible Word of God. We're not being mean. We're just trying to rescue people who are on fire and don't know it. Religious people. This Pharisee goes down. He lifts up his eyes up to God in an arrogant, proud look. And he said, I thank you, God, that I'm not like this man, this publican, this sinner who has his face toward the ground. I thank you that I do this. I tithe. I go to church. I help people out. I live morally. I take care of my family, et cetera, et cetera. And the publican, the sinner, the one who was cut off from faith in God because they were not teaching the word, said, Oh, God, be merciful. To me, a sinner. Jesus said he went home justified. The Pharisee was condemned. But he had religion. He had morals. See, God doesn't accept all that. Because it isn't holiness. Your good works are not holiness. The Bible says without holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Jesus, why do you think Jesus said to Nicodemus, a religious Pharisee, you must be born again? If you're not born again, you're never even going to see the kingdom of God because humility is a prerequisite for repentance of sin and trust in Jesus Christ. You better wake up because the day after you're, you're, I mean the minute, the second you're gone from this world, you will understand it then. I tell you that as a friend because I love you. I'm not trying to put you down. I'm trying to raise you up by the Word of God. But before you're going to be raised up by the Word of God, we're going to have to put you down to humility of understanding we're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. You didn't earn the gift. We received the gift. Amen. The Bible says not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy. Mercy is humility. We don't deserve it. We get it because we trust in it. My friends, I want you to know that Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit because you're close to God. You're finding God. You're close to the Lord. But it's also for Christians who are living and attempting to be like Christ. Humility. He's our greatest example. Let me move through this and show you. So the Bible says then that God resists the proud. And God is opposed to the proud. Proverbs 6, 16 says, These things does the Lord hate, yea, they are an abomination unto him, a proud look. Pride is what got Satan cast out of heaven, condemned him, and he will one day be in the lake of fire. He's having a, he's having a ball right now. But the ball is about to end because midnight is here. Jesus is coming. You say, well, I don't know about Jesus coming. Well, you better start studying because there's 318 verses in the New Testament that speak of the coming of the Lord. Did you know there's, a, there's a 1,100 verses in the Word of God that talk totally about the prophecies concerning Christ's first coming from Genesis to Revelation. And also there are more references about his second coming than there is about his first coming. And when he comes again, it will not be the babe in the manger. That was the humility to bring us to God. It will be when he comes in power and great glory and all the warrior angels with him and they will stand in the earth. They will stand in the sky and the whole world will say men will ask 
cast the rocks to fall upon them and protect them from the God who is coming to bring judgment to this world. Wake up. The fires are starting. Amen. Humility. Humility. Well, God not only resists the proud, but... He gives grace to the humble. Remember that. And God will use his mighty hand to exalt the humble and care for the humble. Don't you love the promises of God? I don't know how many you know, but you need to learn them. And I need to keep growing in them. I've been working on it for 60 years, studying the grace of God, studying how God gives promises, studying what God does for your life. I've been working at it a long time, researching, school, all these kind of things. I'm telling you today, it is a marvelous thing to find how God raises up the humble as he did this entire church and school complex. When we came here 51 years ago, this wasn't sitting here, you know, <laughs> saying, oh, I didn't ride out here one day and look to the right and say, boy, there's a whole, there's a lot, look at that acreage in all those buildings. I wonder if anybody's there. And I opened the doors, nobody's there, so I just moved in. No, 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 no. It was trusting God without money when Shirley and I came. And now today, about $20, $25 million in property, it all belongs to the glory of God. I can't tell you how I was so smart. I can't tell you how I was so great. I can't tell you that I had anything to do with it. God sent people and methods and means, and one after the other, He sent us great people. God blessed us. We're debt-free today to the glory of God. I didn't do that. The Lord did that. Now it has to be how it is. When somebody gives you a compliment and say, you know, you're, you're looking good, you shouldn't say, well, yeah, I'll take care of myself. You know what you should say? Yes, the Lord is good to me and helps me take care of myself. Amen. When your ch child does something, don't be proud and don't teach them pride. You know what you do? Instead, well, instead of saying, I, I think it's better, and I thought of this a little bit, instead of saying, we are so proud of our baby, you should say, we are so pleased with our baby that God has given us such a beautiful baby. Have you thought about that? Well, that sure is a good business you got going. Man, you must be making great money. We, well, God has blessed me to be at the right place at the right time and worked everything out, and we are making money to the glory of God, and I'm honoring Him with it by the, doing the work of the gospel. And all. Take it to give a testimony instead of being egocentric and talking about how great you are. Humble yourself before God, and He will lift you up. That's Jesus teaching. It's so powerful and dynamic. I, I work on it all the time. I work on it all the time. But I'm telling you today, I have nothing that God hasn't given me. You see, my precious wife, who graduated Bible college, so forth, and she was 24 years old when, we, when I pursued her until she caught me. <laughs> <coughs> Been married all this time now. Listen, that was one of the greatest things that happened to me. You think that was an accident? No. I think God gave me a wife that I needed and gave this pastor a pastor's wife that this church needed because she's a good one. Wouldn't you say that? Amen? I mean, God did that. I have healthy children. God did that. I have seven beautiful grandchildren, and some of them are here today with me. Uh, in fact, you guys stand up a minute. Come on, stand up. I wasn't kidding. Stand up. The whole row there. Let's thank the Lord for them, my grandchildren and my, and my sons and daughter-in-law. Some of them are here, not all, but some of them are here. Praise the Lord for that. Thank you. You may be seated. I, you know, I am pleased with them, not proud of them. You know who made those kids? God. God had to give life or they wouldn't be here. You know who keeps them healthy? God. It isn't them. Well, they take the vaccines. They go to the doctor. That's just maintenance. God gave all that so they could do it, but God gave them healthy genes. Listen, whatever we have, let us give glory to God. My youngest son, Brian, who's 45, rebuked me yesterday. I was whining. Yes, I was whining. I said, good gravy. I can't hit the ball far enough to lose it. He said, Dad, 
And he rebuked me. He said, you are 82 years old. You are still good at golf in a lot of ways. You've lost your strength, but look how good God has been to you. And you know, I felt ashamed. Your own son bringing conviction to you. So we knelt down and prayed and I gave him an offering. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. Humility is powerful. I have to catch myself. I have to watch it. I have people come out the door sometimes saying, I'll bet you proud of what you've done here. I said, no. I'm pleased with what God has done here and glad to be a part of it. That's what we should say, right? Amen? Amen, is that right or not? Now, I know I'm supposed to be through around 11, but I'm not going to stop until I get some better amens. I'm just going to do that. I'll tell you another time. Now, listen to the power of humility. God said it was so great when he talked to Israel in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, will what? Humble themselves and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and I will do certain things. Now, that's a principle that God always used, even though it's in the Old Testament. The power of humility. Oh, my goodness. We need to pray without ceasing that God would give us that humility. Let us give God the thanks. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, New Testament, in everything, listen, listen to this carefully, in everything give thanks. How many of you think it's easy to whine when you talk to God? Some of you do it, don't you? I have done it. And all of the other people whom I was gracious to and didn't ask you to raise your hand have done it. It doesn't matter what you're whining about. One of your friends can sit down and give you five different things at least, how it can be a whole lot worse. And if we humble ourselves and really just serve God, He will give us a right path and help us. Now, I, don't want, I want you to think, I want you to practice this. Don't be silly or stupid, just practice it. Boy, that's a lovely child. Yes, God has given us a beautiful child. Great intelligence. We're pleased with him. Not proud. But see if you say proud. And I'm convicting my own self. If we say, yeah, I'm proud of him. And I've said it many, many times. And I've been rebuked by the Lord. We should say, I'm pleased. Can you say that with me? I'm pleased at what God has done because what you have is the best. God isn't going to give you any more than he wants to and any more than is best for you and any more. Listen, whatever, whatever your situation is, we should say, I'm pleased with the Lord and I praise him and I have nothing to whine about, but the devil got into me through some oatmeal or something I ate and I've been whining for a while because it was the devil got into you if you've been whining. One, the Lord. Where does the Bible say, you believers who trust in the Lord, uh, you know, why don't you do some more whining? God says, I, I really would like to hear that. Have you got that in your Bible? Well, you better ditch that Bible and get you a Bible. Amen? Amen. The Lord never says that. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Listen, you're here today because of God's grace. I'm here today because of God's grace, not because of me. I could have been killed a million times. I could have been gone a million times, but God each time providentially kept me here. Someone says, well, somebody up there must like you. No, somebody up there might not want me right now. <laughs> I'm not finished. I haven't done enough. Whatever. I can't do that. All I can do is be a servant. Jesus showed us that. All you can do is when you have an opportunity, be a servant. When you have an opportunity, give the word of God. When you have an opportunity to help somebody, do it. God, listen, God's glory is coming out there. God's blessing is coming out there. When you take it upon yourself to say, well, I'm out here and I'm pretty, I'm pretty capable. I'm pretty strong. I'm pretty good. I got some money. And I, 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 I. Satan said, I, 11 times in Isaiah and also in Ezekiel when he went against God. You know what he said? I will ascend to the heavens. I will be like the most high God. When you and I take pride into our life that we're running things, we're saying the same thing Satan just said. 
I don't know about you, but I'm not running my life. I know what a mess it can be if I run it. I just want to be obedient. Can I get an amen on that? I want to humble myself and say, God is the source of all my blessings. God is the source. You know, we don't even realize that God owns everything we have in us too. You know, you don't have a hair on top of your head that God doesn't own. If, it, if you own it, when did you create it? Now, I know some of you are letting it grow, but you didn't create it, did you? When you come to a point where God owns everything and you'll be humble enough to give Him the glory, you'll start obeying the Bible and understanding that you're in partnership with Him financially and everything else. I've been in that partnership 60 years. And man, has He come through for me. Now, I could be proud and say, well, I'm going my own way. I, I know how to make money. I know how I am, I am, I am. And God will say, well, I'll withdraw my blessings some and we'll see how, fall, how you fall flat on your face. Uh-huh. Right? Amen? All right. Well, you've said amen enough today. <laughs> Let's stand together, please. I, I just wonder this morning, as I've spoken the word of God to you and uh, we're preparing for baptism, I just wonder today as I've spoken to you, if you know that I love you and that I'm your servant, I've failed you, I have not always been the servant I should be. I know that. I know my own flaws, and there are many. But I want you to know everything good that God has done in my life. The Lord has done it. I've just been the vessel through which he's done it. Amen? Now listen carefully. Some of us need to make a strong, prayerful vow to God today. You know what a vow is? Did you ever get married? That's what a vow is. <laughs> it's a contract with God. And ask the Holy Spirit to help you to be humble and to say things that will glorify God and help you to be thankful and humble. I have to do it. I have to renew my vows. I have to keep my vows. I have to be cognizant of that. It's easy to get proud. Very easy. It's always right there by you. It's always ready to move in. And God gives grace to the humble. I think some of us are so proud that we could and you ought to, while Bob's playing before we even begin the service or after we begin the service, to humble ourselves and come and get on our knees here at this old-fashioned altar. I think a lot of us have gotten way too proud to let people think we're not perfect. Well, if I prayed it down there, well, first of all, you're only praying to God. It's not going to be me, but I'm not trying to condition it. I'm just simply saying there's times when I need to pray before God. And this is the house of God. This is the altar of God. We built it this way. Al Donnell and some others helped me build this from out here all the way out here so we'd have a great altar. And these front pews are the greatest pews in the church because from here over, nobody ever sits on them unless we're really jammed and crowded in the winter. You could kneel in front of them and say, Lord, I, I know I've been sinning against you. I've been independent. I've been proud. And I want to humble myself. I really do want to do your will the rest of my days. I don't know. It's between you and the Lord. Now, let me, let me talk about this. If you just have religion and you're counting on your church, you are not doing the will of God because you're not saved. I've never believed a church could take me to heaven or baptism or good works or anything else. I believe it is the grace of God through the death of Jesus died in my place for my sins. And therefore, I should say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Can you say that? I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Boy, that nails the humility right through your heart, doesn't it? Well, I don't think I'm as bad as some people. Yeah, but you're a whole lot worse than many. There's no pride in being as good as somebody. What, what is that? If you're not saved, I'm your friend. I'm asking you not to leave. 
till you let us show you from the word how by faith you can receive the gift of salvation. If you love the Lord and love what's going on here, the missionary work on 94 fields of the world, the staff that loves God and works so good here, our staff is long-term, they love God, they're doing a great job. Don't make us sweat. Help us. Pray for us. Don't exempt yourself from giving. That's God's way of humbling you to say, you know, I really do need the Lord to help me. When you don't, you're saying, nah, I don't think so. I got it under control. Pride. I don't know what your need is today, but I love you, and I will love you more if you humble yourself before the Lord. I want you to know that, that I, I am not a perfect pastor. I want you to know that I never was a perfect pastor. I want you to know I never have been a perfect pastor. But I'm inviting you not to join me. I'm inviting you to join the one who is the perfect Savior, the God of all, the Sovereign, Jesus Christ. Are you joined to Him? Are you walking in fellowship with Him? Are you doing the will of God? We're going to sing Amazing Grace, and as we do, we have pastors and we have ladies. We have my, wife, my wife, I think, is in here. She's working in other departments, but I think she's here. In fact, I know she is. I saw her over there with my children. Come and, come and let's pray. Come and let's seek revival. Come and let's say, oh God, fill every pew, even in the summertime. I know God is blessing us, but fill every pew, even in the summertime, with people we can win to Christ. Fill every pew with people who really want to serve God and don't want to play games. Whatever it is, would you pray about coming? But you know, if you have to pray about coming, you already should come. You've already got your answer. Let's sing together.